if you were growing in wisdom, what would that look like? And what would be the impact on others? And I have another question for you. What would change in our organizations if every individual were becoming wiser and whole? I'm Dr. Rob McKenna, and welcome to the Wild Conversation, where we make the best thinking in psychology, leadership, and organizational science accessible to leaders who are willing to learn and edit for their sake and for the sake of others. And today we are continuing our latest series on toxic leadership and specifically wisdom uh, with the subtitle, When Emotional Intelligence Isn't Enough. And for anyone new to WILD and what whole and intentional leader development is about, this is about an intentional investment in the generation of courageous and sacrificial leaders. And as we talk, tackle this topic of wisdom and toxic leadership, our hope is this, this will be from a whole perspective. And what does that mean? Here are a couple of things to think about. Whenever I think about what whole is about, some of the things that we talk about often, one is this is a long play. It's a longer term perspective beyond just what's happening today. We step back as well as step into this moment. This is about focusing on the one with an eye to the many. When we think about whole, it's seeing individuals for the nuance in their own story while also paying attention to empirical evidence that addresses what's going on across larger populations of people, something that we call research. So it's that, how do we, how do we stay in touch with the nuance of the individual and be in touch with what does research tell us about larger populations? Um, this involves an intentional focus on ourselves as well as others. Who we are and whose we are are what the whole story is about. And it always involves just as many questions as it does answers. This is about invitations over prescriptions alone. And that's why, as you know, I'm in this with you in terms of my own questions. And, and number five, a willingness to edit and to learn and to even sacrifice for the sake of others when necessary. And the reason that whole leader development, I think related to this topic of wisdom, is such a paradigm shift. Think about this. It's so fascinating that most of our ways of seeing people are typically 2D. They're two-dimensional at best. And the whole journey of actual human beings as leaders happens in 3D, 4D, and even five or six dimensions. It's not as linear sometimes as we want it to be. And that's why so much of leader development sometimes has missed the mark for us bringing about fundamental and lasting change. And so I, I, it's a big aspiration. And that's why we do that through our system for developing leaders. That's what we're doing with many in many of your organizations. Um, and toxicity is our theme. And so I got I have to address this again. I, I know some of you have heard this before, but I just, here's what toxicity is about. To be toxic is to be poisonous and very harmful or unpleasant in a pervasive or insidious way. Insidious means proceeding in a gradual, subtle way, but with harmful effects. To be a toxic leader is to be poisonous and harmful and unpleasant and pervasive and insidious. It means that it may not happen all at once, but that poison will spread, that, that poison we spread occurs gradually, subtly, and produces harmful effects. So wisdom and toxicity. Okay, now just think about what I just said about how the way toxic is defined. Now think about wisdom and toxicity. As I even prepared to just open up this conversation, even saying them in the same sentence almost makes no sense. It's like oil and water or cold and meatballs. I had some last week and it just doesn't work for me. I don't know if that works. Some of you love it. You're like, what? Oh, I love cold meatballs. I'm like, I don't love cold meatballs. So they just don't work together. And whatever it is that you're like, this, it's hard to even have this conversation. Like if we were wise, would we ever be toxic? It's an interesting question. If we were wise, would we ever, and I'm not saying no, but let's think about this. When you think of someone wise, who comes to mind? Who comes to mind? Think of someone who you would consider wise. For me, it's Yoda. Okay, so why Yoda? I didn't even think about that. I wore my green jersey in, in uh, reference to Yoda. Why Yoda? Some of you may hate Yoda, but I just think Yoda's got some wisdom. Okay, his presence, for me, this is my story. His presence exudes wisdom, but why? There's something about his presence, his way of speaking, and what he thinks about that just exemplifies maybe what wisdom is about. He's not perfect, but he's a person. And I say that because for you Star Wars geeks, 
Yoda's, Yoda's species was never, never named. So I have to call him a person. I don't know what else to call him. Okay. So it's like species was named. So, but he, this, he's, he's this being who has wisdom. It's also interesting to make note of how Yoda speaks and why Yoda speaks that way. I've heard it said that Yoda spoke that way, the way he did. And I'm sorry, if you don't know who Yoda is, like, go check it out. Um, because, but some people said that he spoke that way because George Lucas needed a way to avoid creating another alien language. It was interesting. And, and Yoda had so many lines in the Star Wars script that he wanted to avoid too many captions. It was interesting. And so what emerged that he described is a way of getting to it's in the way he spoke was a way of getting to the point philosophically without too many words that actually George Lucas kind of tripped into. So think about the way Yoda speaks truly wonderful. The mind of a child is, or a Jedi you will be, or broccoli you will eat. And if you care at all, and most of you don't, but I do, what Yoda does is backwards English grammar. So what he does, he puts the object of a sentence before the subject. And it, it was interesting, right? Because it, it allowed, in some ways, what, it, what, what George Lucas tripped into was a way for Yoda to express deeply philosophical things about thinking that have application to our daily life. And whether you thought about Yoda, maybe, or someone else, and that's likely because who other than me would think of a Star Wars character, why did they come to mind? And what is wisdom? Anyway. So here are a few things, a few definitions of wisdom. Wisdom is the quality of having experience, knowledge, and good judgment. It's the ability to discern inner qualities and relationships. It includes insight and good sense and judgment. It's the ability to use your knowledge and experience to make good decisions and judgments. These are, these are, these are definitions of wisdom. I love that. The ability to use knowledge and experience to make good decisions and judgments. Let me, let me tell you from... Like, what, it, what is it not? What is wisdom not? Here's some thoughts. It's not wordy. It's not compulsive. It's not boastful. It's not rushed. It's not vengeful. It's not mean. It's not blaming. It's not reactive. It's not conniving. It's not ugly, it's not panderous, it's not sneaky, and it's probably not overly convicted. And I, and I got to say something that occurred to me even very recently as I was thinking about this. I, I need to say this. I, I don't even think that wisdom on its own is likely enough. I don't, by definition, if you think about that, some of those definitions I just read to you, I don't know if it's enough because that ability to discern something deeper, it's interesting, right? A person with the capacity to apply deeper knowledge to action could use it for less than noble things, even what some of us might describe as evil things. So I want to propose to you an idea, the idea of whole wisdom, the idea of whole wisdom. And I would define that this way. And, and uh, we'll, we'll put this in the notes for you. The presence and ability to discern what is really going on without reactivity or compulsion. Connecting knowledge and action in a selfless way that produces ongoing learning and thoughtful progress on the most important things. That produces ongoing learning and thoughtful progress on the most important things. Wisdom tells us that it isn't just about what we do that brings about change, but also how we think. So I wanna, if, if we just take the, the fundamental definition of wisdom, just think about that for a second. It tells us that it isn't just about what we do that brings about change, but also how we think. And by the way, research support this, like wisdom would support this. If we, if we lean into what we've learned in the past, some people believe that actions, they just like, they'll make pithy statements that say like, if you just change your behavior, it'll change how you think. And other people will say, well, if you change your thinking, it'll change the way you behave. The reality is that some pretty smart social scientists, one guy named Alan Wicker that I studied under when I was in graduate school, the research is pretty clear. Like it's a chicken and the egg thing. They affect one another. And that's why I think wisdom is so interesting because it's the application of both. It's the application of both. And I come back to my question, like, 
what would change in our organizations if every individual in the way I even just described it so far were becoming wiser and whole? Now, I find it also interesting that we have a 1920s, I don't know if that's where this came from, but it kind of sounds like it did, reference to wise guys, <laughs> right? And I, I, I'm going to try this my best. This is my best, uh, best wise guy accent. Wise guy, eh? Like, what do we mean when we say that? Like, someone says stuff when we go, wise guy, eh? You're being a wise guy. Like, what do we mean when we say that? And I think this is what I thought about. I thought, what do we mean? We mean they said something that was about something under our skin they got under our skin like they were seeing something and they called it out and i'm like oh you're a wise guy you know you like you called something else that was a little bit deeper wisdom is about something closer than our skin it gets beyond the surface i love uh some of you heard this before but i love this quote from henry now and this is my paraphrase but uh, Henry Allen said, our goal is to have our feet firmly planted in the stream that runs deep beneath the illusions of acceptance and rejection. To have our feet firmly planted in the stream that runs deep beneath the illusions of acceptance and rejection. It's hard to imagine a wise, wise person who is living for acceptance and rejection. It's, it's deeper than that. It's under our skin. And who among us wouldn't want to grow in that? I'm, I, sh I sure do. But how? And what's required to get there? So. I want to give you some of the requirements as I was thinking about for whole wisdom. And it's a, it's a long list. So we'll, we'll get this to you in the notes as well. But there's some things that if you think about, it, which is highlighting something that I'll, I'll finish with. An awareness of context. Like think about a wise person, history, story, experience, the players, the culture, an awareness of context, a long play perspective. An experience of failure and success a resting in who you are that allows you to no longer be defined by it. A conviction that doesn't boast. A connection to others that neither panders nor ignores. A presence that is deeply here. A presence that is deeply here. I, this is just things that came to mind. A mysterious peace and patience. A love for others that is neither selfish or boasting. An ability to see what is and call it out for that. In other words, a capacity to pay attention to what is. An openness to continuing to learn. This is an interesting one to me. An appreciation for the power of results without an obsession about them. An appreciation for the power of results without an obsession about them. And an acceptance of the great paradoxes of life, avoiding our sometimes human temptation to resolve everything. And if that sounds like a long list, I think that's what's fascinating about developing wisdom is it kind of includes a lot. It includes a lot of things. But I'll tell you what, what is interesting to me is how little we talk about wisdom in organizational spaces and what's never enough. Like what's never enough? Like emotional intelligence. I think it's an important thing. I'm not denying that. It includes things like self-regulation, self-awareness, empathy, social awareness. But it's not enough to make us wise, to be emotionally intelligent. I, I think it's interesting too, because sometimes emotional intelligence, I think always think about a used car salesman at their worst. I'm not saying some of you might be used car sales people and you're great, you know? But it's like, you could actually use emotional intelligence to actually get a sale is it possible? It's interesting. What's also never enough to be whole wisdom is an answer. IQ, grit, compassion, failure, success, conviction, performance, motivation, goals, money, diversity, engagement, culture, agility, learning. Each of these may not be enough on its own to develop wisdom, but likely is formed by our experiences with all of them. All these things that we experience have the potential to build wisdom. Whole wisdom begs us to get to the root of the issue, to get under the skin. And I come back to that question, what would change in our organizations if every individual were becoming wiser and whole? Okay, so as, you, as your mind has gotten warmed up into spending just a moment today thinking more deeply about wisdom, there are probably some questions begging for deeper investigation and insight into wisdom. So here are some of mine. 
I'm going to just, I, it's what I do, right? I've got questions. I've got questions about the things I'm talking about. Is our goal for all of us to be primarily known as wise? I would say probably not. I would hope that we would all grow in wisdom, but we probably all may not be Yoda, but we can grow in wisdom. So I, when I said, said primarily, like, is it okay? Some of us might have that role to play. Number two, is wisdom relevant in our organizations today? Like, is, is wisdom, like, well, this whole wisdom relevant today? Do we need that description I gave you before? Do we need that in, in our that description? Of course we do. In fact, it's frightening to imagine what our world would look like without some wise people, some whole and wise people in our organizations. Number three, is there less wisdom today in our organizations and our world than there was 20 years ago? These are just questions that came to mind. Likely not. That's what I've been thinking. There probably is no more or no less, but there is the possibility that the wisdom has migrated to new places or may migrate to other places when it has no acceptable place to be cultivated in our organizations. Number four, is it necessary to build cultures that are not only not are that are not hostile to wisdom, but instead invite it? And I, I say it again, like I'm kind of frightened of a world where or even an organization that doesn't. Like I like, could we be organizations that invite wisdom? Number five, why do we talk about it so little? That's why do we talk about it so little? Or are we simply using other language to describe it? Is our business or even our not-for-profit goals are, are of results counter to an invitation to wisdom in our organizations. That's why I think that opening question is kind of interesting. And number six, please be thinking. This is my number six question. What are you thinking? Be thinking about your own questions here. What is the question you haven't answered yet regarding wisdom in your organization or in, or in you as a leader? So where does it come from? Honestly, I believe... <laughs> Most of you know that I was trained, um, Daniel and I both were trained as industrial organizational psychologists. And I think there's a lot that our field has to offer us. Um, that wisdom comes from a knowledge and experience, but knowledge and experience aren't enough. They aren't enough. Like you could, you know what I mean? Like you could go through experiences and gain knowledge and never actually become wise probably. It requires an intentional, and by that, it usually means structured and habitual, something we choose to do on a regular basis where we're integrated, we're integrating what we know and what we're learning as we get results, as we innovate, as we work together. The development of wisdom requires us to pause and to do that integration, what we know with our daily activities and learning in areas that have been studied and have been shown to develop whole leader capacity. And here's some of those things, like just imagine what it means to cultivate this and build a culture, an inviting culture for wisdom, experience, a place where we would intentionally reflect and talk about and, and on our experience, our climbs and crises and crucibles and an in, in intentional, thoughtful reflection and conversation on them, relationships. Would any of us deny that who we're surrounded by and who we surround in investments has an effect on our cultivation of wisdom? Our investment in others. What if our organizations were wisdom laboratories because of how we intentionally invest in others around us? Wisdom laboratories because of this application of what we're the experience and the knowledge, like in, in these thoughtful ways. Competence, knowing what is strong in you and what is not, or what is changing, is a key component of landing in ourselves and our self awareness. And could we be wise without it? I don't know. Learning. What does learning have to do with it? Understanding how you learn and your motivations. Another deeper layer of awareness and seeing the, the learning of others. Calling and purpose, knowing why you are here. It's hard to imagine Yoda like not being grounded in a deeper why. Results. It's funny, we kind of dismiss these things as, as counter to each other, but results in wisdom. Results, seeing evidence of progress will deepen whole wisdom as long as it's tied to learning. And then presence, working intentionally on how we show up, being just as important as anything we do. Whole wisdom is built through the real stuff of life. That's what's so fascinating. It's the connection between the block and tackle pieces of our leadership and what we're learning and understanding and de deepening in ourselves. We become wiser as we live, learn, practice, and lead and gain knowledge with intention. And if any of it sounds familiar to you, it's because it's the foundation upon which all of our work at Wild is done with leaders. 
It's why we're doing this every day, Connect, connecting those block and tackle pieces of leading and organizing and progress and business to our minds, hearts, and our thinking. But that's what this is about. So back to Yoda. I did hear one other story about Yoda that was interesting. And I'm going to read you a quote. In a book titled The Art of the Mandalorian, Season 2, executive producer David Poloni said, uh, revealed that George Lucas was concerned about making sure baby Yoda, there's a baby Yoda now, received proper Jedi training. And he said, I had a talk with George, and at one point about the child, baby Yoda, uh, his main concern, George's main concern was that the kid has to have a proper amount of training. George Lucas's beef with the new story and the new baby Yoda was that he didn't have the proper amount of training. I think this is interesting. Life and work is our training ground for wisdom. And, and George Lucas, I think, knew that the, the character wouldn't make sense. How do you develop you, you, just like Grogu is his name, Baby Yoda, can't learn to bring wisdom to future Luke, Luke Skywalkers without training. Intentional learning will be required for him and for us to develop, to develop wisdom, to develop whole wisdom. And so what in the world does this have to do with toxicity as I finish? As I said before, it's almost impossible to imagine a toxic environment that is oozing with whole wisdom. That's why creating a climate for wisdom to flourish and grow may be one of the most important antidotes for our toxicity epidemic what would change in our organizations if every individual were becoming wiser and whole where you and everyone around you was experiencing that and that was what was happening a movement toward wisdom wisdom i do believe this is a movement toward wholeness so let's just keep the conversation going <laughs>